open. Hello everyone, welcome to 7Gen Live. It is Friday, so I'm feeling extra good today. We're gonna have a really cool discussion today. We got Mike Tilson with us today. Um, I hope you guys are all doing well. I just wanted to say that I know we all know that Indigenous Peoples Day was on Monday and we all had a fun day to celebrate. It was really cool to see everyone's posts about Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, all over Facebook, all over Instagram. It was really inspiring. And with that being said, on Monday was the launch of the new Land Back campaign, which is huge. If you guys have not watched their video on Facebook yet, you gotta watch it. We'll actually post a link to that video on our Sichangu CDC Facebook page. And personally, I just feel so moved and inspired by this campaign because it's not just for indigenous people, it's for everyone who lives on Unchimaka. We all have to learn to live, to live together in a good way. So with that being said, Mike, are you just super stoked for today like I am? I am super stoked. This is going to be an awesome show. Like you said, Monday, Indigenous Peoples Day was was really cool. All kinds of awesome um, Indigenous-led media events going on, talking about food sovereignty, talking about land back, like all kinds of good stuff. It gets me super excited. I'm always happy to talk to, to Nick and, and kind of hear what he's got going on. Um, you know, really, even for me, like personally, with somebody that I look to a lot when I first started working out here as as a, a model of somebody doing awesome work so it's pretty cool it's gonna be a great show it's Friday man it's fall it's cold yeah. out like everything's good life is good right now and it's not snowing I don't know if it's snowing in Rapid City but it's not snowing here on Rosebud so that's a big plus uh, but let's go ahead and bring Nick on hi Nick can you hear us okay oh there he is if I can, he's only wash day or Humpeti wash day now. It's afternoon. Oh, welcome on. How you been? What you been up to, Nick? What's good? Oh, yeah. Well, first, I just want to, uh, yeah, I've, I've been good. I've been good. I've been good. I mean, we've been building Indian Collective, doing the great work that we're doing over here. We got this awesome new campaign called the Land Back Campaign, where we're going to get lands back into indigenous hands and tear down systems of white supremacy in the process. And, um, and just do, yeah, yeah, just like staying busy is busy, really, really busy. Of course, getting ready for winter, um, all of that stuff too. So yeah, no, it feels good to be, a, it's Friday after a long week. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'm excited to kind of dive into the conversation. Uh, and just way I wanted to introduce myself a little bit to, to those that are listening out there. Um, you know, say uh, uh, Nick Tilson of Machiapi, Chante Awashte, Napa Chuzapolo. My name is Nick Tilson. Uh, my mother is Joanne Tall, um, Janice from the Porcupine Manderson area. My father is Mark Tilson, senior from the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul area, but now he lives in lives in Chisapa, up in up in uh, Rapid City. So, and I'm actually I'm calling in from the uh, from Minneluzaha, from, from from Rapid City uh, today here at Indian. Indian Collective Headquarters. It's all quiet here because we're closed because of COVID. But I was like, hey, that's a good place to jump on the call. Totally. Hey, for anyone who doesn't know, where uh, where are the NDN offices located at? Where are you guys at? Right now, we're located on 317 Main Street, uh, right down in downtown Rapid City, um, just uh, uh, right kind of next to Harriet and Oak Coffee Shop. We want to get a really expensive overpriced coffee it's right there <laughs> if you want to get some good coffee with good company i used to say come over to ndn it's free um but where our offices are closed at COVID because of covid so it's not open so you guys could drive by and honk the horn or something but <laughs> yeah everything's pretty shut down because of because of the rona talk a little bit about that like what I mean, for me, like driving through Rapid City, I mean, listen, I'll be honest, I, I love Harry to Milk, overpriced, but they got some good stuff. When you come downtown, though, and see NDN Collective offices right downtown, like, what is, talk about that, like, that's significant, that feels good to me to come through and see that. Yeah, I mean, I think the original idea is, you know, when we were first launching, we, we kind of, we kind of wanted to put the people on notice, right, <laughs> uh, in, in many ways, we wanted to, we wanted to, 
put the relatives on notice. And, and so our attitude is, hey, should we jump in and put a, our, our headquarters, you know, right down in downtown Rapid City? Um, and um, and that was intentional. You know, I think that also we, we, we actually put our, our, our offices in proximity to the jail, too, um, because we, because we understand the over incarceration of our indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, and, and so, yeah, there was some definitely some intentionality about that. You know, I think optics are important, like, hey, you know, we're, we're down. And so um, the exciting thing is still, you know, our office has been here for two years and we're actually, and we, we've just been leasing this place in downtown Rapids. Mm. We have actually purchased a, a building and land uh, over on Nolwood Avenue. Um, as you're, you know, if you're driving up, if you're going down Haynes and then you take a ride on Nolwood, like you're going up to the to the AMC uh, uh, movie theater um, on your way to OLC, we bought a building right there um, that's under redevelopment right now. That's going to be the headquarters, and and so we wanted to buy, we wanted to buy a place that was on the north side where all the natives are in a pretty public and open space. Um, and so that that will and, and we'll announce that that that'll be some kind of like grand opening that we do in the springtime, probably like May or something like that. Awesome, Nick, it's a Chongu Nation. You heard it here first. <laughs> 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 what is Indian Collective, and how big is your your team of people? So yeah, so Indian Collective is. Uh, is a national organization dedicated to building the collective power of indigenous people um, by investing into the self-determination of Indian of indigenous people that are doing the, the work of defend, develop, and decolonize. And what we mean by that is folks that are defending air, land, water rights, community, um, at the same time, developing regenerative inclusive economies and food systems and uh, education centers and and then decolonizing through the revitalization of indigenous languages, ceremonies, life ways, mm -hmm. and um, uh, decision-making structures, governance structures, um, but clearly having the backbone of, uh, of investing into the self-determination of indigenous folks doing that work as the fundamental principle. It's not, it's not for us to decide you know, what the Diné should do um, or what the people of Agwasasni should do, or the Taino from Puerto Rico, um, it, it is, you know, the solutions exist in those communities, and we want to invest into those solutions and into the power building strategies. And so we do that through a multifaceted approach. Indian Collective is, think of it like this, Indian Collective is a toolbox for Indian country. And that movements and change and social enterprises and businesses, those are led by the people. And so change happens from people and human beings. Our organizations and our things are merely tools to uh, accomplish those things. And, and so we have, a, uh, we have a grant making arm that does grant making. And we currently do grant making to over, uh, you know, my numbers are probably way off, are way, uh, way lower than they actually are, but we're, we're probably up to close to 200 partners right now that we do grant making into, you know, hundreds of indigenous communities around, around the United States. We have a lending arm that is just now getting off the, uh, off the ground to, to provide larger um, financing for projects. So it's not really consumer lending, but like development projects are things like the Buffalo herd that Chichangu CDC and Redco are doing that need larger capital intensive solutions because really nobody's doing that kind of lending in Indian country. And then we have um, an organizing and action arm of Indian Collective. This is where we have our, this is like the part of the collective where our campaign work lives um, because we're not, we're not just grant makers, we're not just lenders, we're like frontline activists and organizers too. And so uh, as many indigenous people are, in fact, most people are, uh, you know, at different times, and and so in that part of the, but the, in that part of Indian Collective is where our three campaigns that we're currently doing sit. You know, we have a education equity campaign that's led by Sarah Pierce, Amy Sazu, um, Mary Bowman, and that great team over there 
that are doing the work of pushing for uh, uh, um, education equity for Native American children in South Dakota and fighting for ways to get publicly fund uh, public education dollars to fund indigenous models of community-based education. Um, and then we have uh, and then we have uh, the work that Andrew Ironshell is leading around the climate justice work that we're doing. And currently, obviously, with Dakota Access Pipeline up there, with with um, with uh, the KXL Pipeline down, down here, there's all kinds of organizing that must take place in order uh, for that work to happen. And so and so that's where that work's happening. And then lastly, uh, Crystal Tubles is the Crystal Tubles is the director of the Land Back campaign um, here at the Indian Collective, uh, and one of our good relatives, uh, Connor, um, who's who's Yaki and Kumaye from 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 down along the border, um, who are running that campaign. And uh, so Indian Collective is like this crazy ecosystem of like we're doing a bunch of things in pursuit of a pretty simple mission that we believe that when indigenous people are properly resourced and their self-determination is invested into, it radically changes um, the future for not only indigenous people, but for all people. In fact, when indigenous people are properly resourced and their solutions are invested into and their human rights are honored and treaties are honored and um, you know the, the solutions that we come up with contribute to actually a more just and equitable world for all, pe for all people and mother earth. Um, and that's something that we know. And so we're like, hey, let's build an organization around it. And, um, and, and, and I'll share too that like, Indian Collective grew out of the place-based work that I was leading at the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation on Pine Ridge in my home community, in my home district of Porcupine. And um, one of the reasons that we created the Indian Collective is because when we were at Thunder Valley, uh, we had over probably over a three-year period, we probably had like 43 different tribes, 27 different native nonprofits and tribal enterprises. Uh, coming from over 70 different indigenous communities that were asking the questions of, hey, we want to do, we, we want to do what um, you guys are all doing over there, but within the context of our own culture and the climate and spirit of place. And it's funny because at first I was like, first of all, we're barely pulling this off. <laughs> uh, second of all, <laughs> um, uh, not only we are not only are we barely pulling this off, we are also um, we are also have very little capacity to like help other people because we're because we're barely pulling this off. But if you come here, I'll share with you what we're doing. I'm an open book, um, and it's funny because I was sitting down after sort of tribal leader after tribal leader and grassroots leader after grassroots leader and nonprofit leader. And I was basically saying, don't do what we did, how, we, how we're doing it. I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. <laughs> um, it's extremely complex. And what I realized is that it wasn't about taking Thunder Valley's, uh, what Thunder Valley was doing on the road to these different communities. It was about changing the conditions in which indigenous leaders, communities and self-determination self is actually supported. And um, and so that's where I was like, oh, we need to change the conditions. We need to, we need to increase the grant making to indigenous people by, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. We need to increase the amount of lending capital to indigenous communities by hundreds of millions of dollars. And we need to change the policies uh, and systems that currently impact lives of our people. And if we create a, a system like that, then the conditions will be changed and they will be like, hundreds of Thunder Valley type of things happening around the world and our rights and our rights being advanced. So that's that's what Indian Collective is about. I know that was like a lot of information. You can check out our website, keep following our stuff. I was gonna say, you, you must have telekinetic powers because you, you read my mind on all the questions I was gonna ask. That, that was awesome. Um, such a cool journey and story of, of kind of how y'all have started. Obviously, over here, Red Coast, Chungo CDC, like, partnered with you guys. Super grateful for the role that you're stepping in and, and playing kind of on the national stage. Um, I think, you know, when I really think back on 
like shifts in my own understanding and thinking like Thunder Valley played a huge role in that, like Thunder Valley early, I think started putting some of this, this kind of work on the map um, and the work that you guys did and in, in, in getting that going. And then uh, the natural step into kind of the national stage is, is really cool. And the piece that you talked about too, that really resonated and to me was really what I was hearing on indigenous people's day was this is not just solutions or ideas that help Indian country. These are things that are going to help everyone. When, when Indian country gets to lead, when indigenous people get to be in the front and, and bring that creative, I, you know, that creative capacity really that's inherent in the communities, awesome things start to happen for everyone around. So I, I really appreciate you saying that. And it gets me excited. It gets me excited for the work y'all are doing. Absolutely. Yeah, we could, do we want to unpack land back a little bit? Because people are like, Heck yeah. Is, Heck yeah. Back? Sounds cool. Sign me up, but what is it, right? <laughs> um, yep. uh, it, so yeah, no, I think, I mean, first we want to say like land back and, and to be clear too, uh, Crystal Tubal's like follow her stuff. She's awesome. She's the, the campaign director of land back, um, you know, works here at Indian Collective. Uh, the first thing that we like to say about land back is land back is not something any one organization owns. Land back is a movement that has lived in the hearts and minds of indigenous people ever since our land was taken. And all, and so in some ways, this campaign and this work and this movement is about continuing on a long legacy of land defenders and land warriors and people who have come before. And it's also not just about physical land, right? It, and it's it, technically, it's not even about ownership of land. It's about stewardship and caretaking of the land and rebuilding the relationship with the land in the first place. And so, you know, when we say land back, land back is not just about land, it's about, um, it's about dismantling the very things that were created for the, the that made it possible for the stealing of our, of our lands. And the revitalization of the things that were, that were damaged and taken from us in the process of stealing of our lands. So the revitalization of our indigenous languages, our ceremonies, our life ways, our societal and familial and Teoshpai structures are many of the things that we're talking about. Um, as far as the campaign goes itself, um, you know, we have four we have four basic demands: defund, dismantle, return, and consent. Um, defund the military industrial complex that has that 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 contributes that made it possible for the stealing of our land and has maintained the stealing of our land and results in the over policing and excessive forces and uh, over incarceration of indigenous people today. Secondly, dismantle, dismantle the system of white supremacy that was created um, that made it possible for the stealing of our people of, of our lands and con con continuously maintains that. Um, and so when we talk about white supremacy, we're not talking about, hey, that person's a white person and we don't like them because of that. What we're actually talking about is, is why, uh, you know, why is, a, why is a native kid, you know, down Corn Creek have a lower life expectancy than a person living in Rapid City? Why is, uh, you know, why, why is somebody, uh, you know, why is a young uh, woman at Upper Cup meet more likely to commit suicide than a white suburban girl the same age, you know, in the suburbs of Sioux Falls, right? These, this is what we're talking about. There's a system in place. There's a system in place in which benefits one group of people over another group of people. And it just so happens to be that it's been on the backs and the lands of indigenous folks. So that when you talk about dismantling white supremacy, there's systems that are in place that ensure that are, have been created to ensure that we don't get our land back as indigenous people, and that and to ensure to ensure that we're not prosperous in our in our in our efforts. Um, you know, there's there's provisions in the Bureau of Land Management, the National Forest Service, the National Park Service, um, and so uh, that's part of the dismantling that we talk about. So defund, dismantle, return, and it is about returning land. So when we talk about returning lands, we're talking about returning public lands public lands back into uh, indigenous hands. And, um, 
And the reason why we say that too is that we think that it's fundamentally important, like public systems have been created, whether it be parks or national parks and these different things have been created that as ideas to quote unquote protect the land, but they have been actually used as mechanisms to extract the people and the resources from those lands. Um, and so we gotta, we gotta return stewardship back into indigenous uh, hands. And then lastly is consent. So again, defund, dismantle, return and consent. Consent is really important. We wanna enter into a whole new policy era. The past 40 years of Indian country policy has been entirely focused on um, consultation. All right, we're gonna consult you, quote unquote, consult you before we do this to you. We're gonna consult you um, to get, you know, to, to before we build a pipeline through your territory. We're gonna consult you at something that impacts education and the lives of your children, but we're not gonna get consent. <laughs> and so what we're basically saying is we wanna enter into an entire new policy era of not just the US government, but nations around the world in dealing with indigenous people and, and, and to put to bed an era of, cons uh, of consultation and into a new era of consent and free and prior informed consent. Um, one that is aligned with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, because if you think about it, if they needed our consent, would there be a KXL pipeline coming, trying, trying to come to our territory? Would there be gold and uranium mining in the Black Hills? Hell no, there wouldn't be because they would be needing our consent. And so this changes the game, right? So when we're talking about building power and changing paradigms, this part's fundamentally important. Um, and, you know, as we think about land back as a movement, right? Like a movement, when something's a movement, nobody can control, no, nobody controls it, right? Um, that's not the way it works. Like. Like if, it, if somebody's controlling it, and guess what? It's not a movement. <laughs> um, uh, but at the, the campaign that sits with an Indian collective, our goal of this campaign is to connect, to resource, to amplify, and to politicize the land back movement. And I think that one of the cool things about this is that we have to, if we want to fight for liberation and we want to get our lands back, and we wanna improve the lives of our families, our children, our people, we have to create solutions. We also have to move our thinking along. We can't be stuck in thinking. And so um, there's many things that we have to do in order to do that. And so land back is a, is a framework to be able to do that. It's a, it's a framework. And if you think about it, like this is a huge opportunity like in this country right now, because of um, the political, climate of the time that we are in. And I want to acknowledge that like the, the political temperature in this country was really, really a lot of it was created by the leadership for the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter and the courageous leadership over there. And um, who've been calling out these systems, who've been calling out that these things need to change, right? And have sacrificed many things. And, and I think that one of the organizing principles of the Land Back campaign is um, is about collective liberation and understanding that as we as indigenous people fight for liberation for our communities that we actually have to see other people struggle too. We have to be able to see each other struggle because we're not just fighting to get our land back and fighting to do things for us, but we actually wanna build a world that works for everybody. And we don't wanna repeat what the Washichu or the government did to us onto other people. And that's why when people are out there thinking, oh, land back, I mean, for real, white people get scared, oh, land back, they're coming from my home, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's like, no, actually, we're trying to build a world that works for everybody. Um, but are we coming for land? Hell yeah, we're coming for public land that has been being mismanaged on your current system and is not, is not actually doing good things for, for, for Mother Earth. Um, and it, it's not doing good things for the people, you know. Um, the other thing that's fundamentally important is that we recognize that, like, there's anti-blackness that exists within the our indigenous people's movement and within our communities. But it's not because Indians are inherently 
prejudice towards black people, it's because it's a construct of white, of white supremacy. They have been trying to pin up, pit us against each other since you know they first stole our lands and first stole them from their lands. And, and that the, the reality is is that we have a shared we have a shared enemy and it's the shared enemy isn't white people to be clear. Um, I don't want Mike side eyeing me here, you know. Um, uh, but it, it, it's about a system, and that when we and, and it's important that that both Indians and white folks and black folks and Latinx folks and transgendered folks talk actually talk about white supremacy and systematic racism as a system, um, because it's the things that are currently in place. It's it's why the Supreme Court looks the way it is right now. It's why, it's why we live in a society that the, the, the quote unquote minority is, has, has become and is becoming the majority, yet the, the, the people in power don't reflect the people in the communities. Um, and so I think that that big part of this collective liberation uh, is important, but it also comes back to that we will never arrive at racial justice in this nation unless Indian lands go back into Indian hands. And it is our reparations framework. We already know Indians, we're, we're not just gonna take a payment. We're not gonna say, here's some money. We already got those offers, shitty ones at that too. Um, but we, and so, so, so it has to be, and, and that's where this fits into. And so there's a lot going on here with this land back um, uh, work and movement. And we also recognize that there's so much organizing. It creates a framework for people that are doing land back struggles, struggles to fit their work into. Man, this is Seven Gen Live. It's Friday. We're here with Nick Tilson. For all you just joining, we have had an awesome conversation so far. Man, so much of that just resonated. I could sit here and listen pretty much all day. That, that was awesome. Um, for anybody who just joined the show, throw your comments in. If you have questions, if there's things you're wondering about, show some support, start a watch, watch party, share it. Do what you got to do, but this is great stuff, man. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, um, Jillian. What are you thinking about over there? What's what's running around for you while you're while you're listening to all this? Well, with everything that you said, Nick, I was just thinking. You know, you of all people know that it's a big risk to stand up for just our rights and to stand up against white supremacy. I mean, you're facing some felonies, some charges. Can you give us an update on that and tell us? You know because there are probably a lot of people who want to stand up against this and do something about it, but they're afraid to because they're afraid of the police. They're afraid that, you know, they can have charges dropped on them like so easily. So can you give us an update on that? Yeah. I mean, I would first say this, like, people are, I mean, you know, the media convicts you before you even get a chance to defend yourself. Right. So these are like egregious accusations, right? <laughs> Is what they are. They're egregious accusations and they get to, to be in the framework of charges because of who controls the system and the police system and the court system in society today. So like, I just wanna say that first uh, because I'm always like, wait a second, just cause you accuse somebody of some shit doesn't mean they actually did it. Um, uh, so say that first. And, and I also want to say that one of the reasons why they actually, why they do this, why they attack and try to go after people is to prevent people from speaking up, is to prevent people from protecting their lands, fighting for their lands, fighting for, fighting for freedom, fighting for justice, standing up against the systems. Um, and it's a, so I want to encourage folks that like, uh, you know, that although they're attacking me and they, they're trying to make examples, right, of people that speak out, like, don't be afraid to speak out. Because in fact, when more and more people speak out, they can't do what they're doing, trying to do to me, to everybody. It's impossible. So we, give, we build more power as a people when we don't act from a place of fear, when we act from a place of courage and strength and power. Uh, you know, inner cultural power of who we are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, I mean, the brief update is it's going to drag on for a while. You know, they stacked on all these charges, all these BS charges. You know, there's a lot of the stuff that's on 
um, videos and film. And there was a lot of, you know, this was a very public protest, um, which we were peaceful at on our own lands. And, um, and so I guess we'll see what happens, you know, I mean, uh, they, they haven't, they haven't offered a plea deal yet, you know, um, and, and probably we probably we probably won't even have a conversation about a plea deal in, until they throw out all the BS felonies to start with. Uh, so so yeah, if the you know if the if the uh, if the prosecutor's office here you know is listening in, you know, get rid of all those felonies and uh, it, and then we'll we'll talk about the other stuff. Until then, you know, we'll see your ass in court. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're gonna fight this, you know. Like we're gonna we're gonna keep fighting it. Um, and so it, it's 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 a weird process. Like it's dragged. It'll be dragged on. I mean, it could be springtime before we actually go to trial on my case. And um, and so you know, I think the biggest thing is you know I continue to do the work I'm doing here at Indian Collective. I continue to do the work. Um, that you know that that we're that we've set out to do, um, and um, and we have a great legal team. You know, I, I'm supported by Bruce Ellison uh, out of Rapid City, South Dakota, who's a longtime sort of movement lawyer, um, and then also supported by um, Brendan Johnson, who's a former U.S. attorney for the state of South Dakota. Um, you know, appointed by Barack Obama, the son of you know, former Senator Tim Johnson, um, and. Um, so I got a, a brilliant legal team that's that's building, um, and I think the biggest thing is that like uh, you know I mean it takes courage to do this yes, but it's also like there's a part of me of like guess who you've chosen to fight this right <laughs> like somebody who leads an organization who's dedicated to dismantling this stuff like that's what we're doing like we are we are here to make sure that this cannot continue to happen to our people and um and so like i feel like fighting this you know it's fighting it's changing the paradigm and trying to fight on behalf of many of our people all over so that none of our people can be over prosecuted and charged or try to be you know fear put on them for standing up to our people you know um, and I know all the Oglalas out there that are, that are listening are probably are listening or watching are like, shit, man, you think charges stop me? Shit. So, you know, a while the Oglalas, they'll be like, ain't, ain't no, ain't no chilling, chilling a free speech over here. We'll see, we'll see you in the case <laughs> of You know, Nick, something that was real inspiring to me was being able to to witness you sit down and have a conversation with Steve Allender, who is the mayor of Rapid City. And with that being said, I mean, it's really rare that indigenous people or Native Americans even get the chance to sit down with some of our leaderships, leadership leaders in politics. So what was that like? And do you feel like it was a good conversation? Do you think something good is gonna come out of that? I mean, I'm an organizer. He's a politician. <laughs> that became really apparent. I'm like, we're trying to solve problems here. And yeah. he's trying to find his way out of a problem. Um, and that problem has to be Indians. And I happen to love Indians and my people, um, you know, regardless of their living along the creek, regardless of their struggling with drug and alcohol problems, and regardless of their, you know, houseless. Because um, they ain't homeless, because this is already their home you know um and um yeah i mean sitting down with mayor allender um last last week was it last week i don't know time flies um and it, i think it, it, it you know it, it reminds me of like the difference between the work that i do uh at any collective and the work that like i think that the city does like problems arise and they try to find their way out of a problem as opposed to their way to solving a problem. And Mayor Allender, you know, holding a press conference and telling a bunch of home, you know, houseless Indian people that you should just go home. Like, just go home now. And hey, you people that are feeding them, you should stop feeding them. Because that's, that's why they're here. That's what you're, you're attracting them. Um, you know, that's racist as hell. And I think that, you know, we have to say that to his face and say, wait a minute, you know, we're not just, also, at the same time that we're calling out racism and saying that this is 
bad and that this is wrong, we also have to say, we're here with solutions. We came up here with some solutions. Um, and what, what I realized in that meeting was um, that I think that Mayor Allender like expected us just to show up to that meeting and sort of pound our hand on the fist and holler around. And we offered them some solutions. We even, we even went to Mayor Allender and we're like, here's a piece of land that's not in the floodplain. Um, and you, you haven't, <laughs> and, and we, even got, we even got Mayor Allender to say, hey, I would be open to having tiny houses you know, on a piece of land in the floodplain. I was like, great. You know, we don't want to have our relatives being in, uh, you know, be, being intense through the winter either. You know, it seems like uh, some of the white folks in Rapid, you know, they're sort of split. Like some folks are like, oh, we don't want to have a, we don't want to have a tent city in Rapid City because it lowers our property values. And, you know, I'm trying to sell my house next spring. <laughs> um, you know, there's that. There's also a lot of people with a lot of compassion, you know, that where there's one usual, you know, where, 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 where folks have compassion and, and, and say, hey, I, I don't want to see relatives um, sleeping in tents because I don't want them to freeze to death out there. Oh, and and we, should, we, should, we should make something more humane. And so it was pretty interesting where we got to really tell the, tell the mayor how much we felt about how racist his comments were. And we went there with some short-term and long-term de demands. We asked for a, you know a piece of land that could be done to have uh, some you know to put up a winter camp, and he was like, "I'm not supportive of a tent city, but I would be supportive of a tiny house and a, a you know place." Uh, but also, when I was like, "You got to cut through the bureaucracy," like it, when it when it's go time in the middle, like like winter's coming, like we just got to just do things and make things happen. It's like, well, we got colds and we got. You know, we got zoning, and I was like, ah, with your zoning and with your codes, like the people are already living there, you know. Um, and not to mention, the people have been living in Mini Luzahan before there was a rapid city, <laughs> right? Like, rapid city was named after what we called Mini Luzahan, Swiftwater, right? And then they made it, you know, Washichu and called it Rapid City. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, I think that like coming back to, to your question on Jillian about like what it felt like or what that was like, it, it reminds me that we can both be radical as indigenous people and hold our fist in the air and then walk into meetings with solutions. But what also what I witnessed in that meeting is I watched the politician try to get us to be a certain way and try to commit to a certain thing. And we didn't, we held our line and said, you know, we're not changing on these things. Like the, this, is, this, is, this is how we feel, this is the reality. If you wanna meet us halfway, then, then, then come meet us halfway. But we're not doing it on your terms, we're doing it on our terms. That's fundamentally the difference. And, and, and politicians don't understand that, right? Politicians get elected and be like, hey, you know what? I want to be the mayor who solved the Indian problem, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and I think the reality is like, it doesn't work like that. Like the change just doesn't happen. And, our ex and I told them in that meeting too, our expectation is not for you to solve our problems, dude. Like that's not, that's not we, do we think mayor, the mayor, he's like, you're just the latest white dude. Like, uh, I'm sorry, but <laughs> like, it, you know, um, our problems need to be solved by our people. But we also like, like we are also your constituents. Many of the resources that you steward are actually our resources, and um, and and your, you know, the city is not solving those problems. And so I think the reality is like the people in this community um, are, you know, with the rat, with the creek patrol, and what people are doing. People, are, you know, indigenous people and our allies are like trying to come together to solve a problem, you know? We're not the enemy. We're coming together to try to, try to solve the problem. Um, so yeah, it, it was interesting. You know, it was whatever, politician, latest, you know, politician to sit down with. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I think that we made some headway in the conversation. Um, I don't think that, I also walked out of there, don't think, <laughs> like, I, I think that the, mayor was walking was out of the meeting thinking like how can i stretch this out long enough to where like once winter hits everybody will just go away you know um 
I kind of think in these moments that like, that's not going to happen. Like people are pretty like, I live here. Like, this is my land. There's a land back movement going on now. Like there's all this stuff going on. Like, I'm not, I don't think we're just going to go away, you know? So, you know, we'll see what happens. Awesome. Yeah. I was just really inspired by that because I mean, not many people get the opportunity to do that. So thank you for being our voice. I mean, now he knows who you are and I'm sure he's not going to forget you. <laughs> so that's really important there. Mike, I know you had a question about um, the river, correct? That you wanted to talk to um, Nick about? Remind me, I'm drawing a blank. It's Friday afternoon and I'm getting tired. I think it was one of the rivers in Rapid City. See, I'm really unaware of that. No, that was, yeah, that was the Rapid Creek piece. That was the, the, oh, the when they were creek. going about, yeah, I mean, yeah, talking about me losing. Uh, I, I, I think you're dead on, Nick. And, and two, like, you could see when I was watching the press, like the press conference and then the conversation you all were having with Mayor Allender, I, I think you could just hear the rhetoric. It's just constant rhetoric. There's not like a, a genuine engagement with what's happening. It's like you said, hey, we need to house people, tent city. Like, well, where the hell is that coming from? Like, who, who brought that up? Because you're, you're the one bringing that up. Like, we never said anything about a tent city. Who wants to live in a tent in the wintertime? So it, it's like all this, it's a lot of rhetoric. There's not genuine, genuine conversation happening. And, and I think too, like we talked about this on the show I think last week we brought Weezy on and, and Michael Point and we were talking about like, do people understand the indigenous contributions to Rapid City's economy and to Rapid City's culture and to Rapid City's community? Like people don't understand that and they take these things for granted. Like, almost, you know what I mean? Like own that when it's really like, you, you know, you want to send people, you know, home. Like, do you want to send all that money out of your city too? I don't think so. So like, let's get real about what's going on here. If you really want to go down that road, then let's go down that road. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that we have to stay vigilant, you know, as indigenous people, like we, we are, our, our memory, like let's keep what happened throughout history. Let's keep that current and let us guide us. Because what also I'm in, in, in what I what I under, what I've seen happen, you know, and because I'm from Porcupine, so I'm a, I'm from Pork, you know, <laughs> I got that's where I still live and that's where I do the work. And so whenever we, you know, whenever we created this national organization, I was like, well, I need to at least have you know, get a little off the res, you know, uh, get into the <laughs> get into the into into the kisapa. And what I realized is a lot of white people and white institutions and white politicians, they want to find their Indian. They want to find their safe Indian. They want to find their Indian that's like, oh, here's the, here's the respectable one. Here's the one that, you know, here's the, here's the respectable one. Here's the one that will, uh, you know, be, you know, play inside the lines, you know, who's not going to color outside the box, who's going to, you know, cooperate with our system. And, um, and then they try to make assumptions that anybody who's not willing to color outside the box in their system, oh, those are radicals then. And you see that happening. I mean, shit, two years ago, I was a keynote speaker at the Rapid City Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, here in Rapid City, when we, right after we first established this office, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then fast forward to July 3rd and, and they're sticking, you know, I'm facing 16 and a half years in prison for standing you know, on my own land, uh, while this place was becoming a militarized zone, you know, by the, 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 the misuse of the military on, the, on, on, on people in our community, like, how no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight to, to fight for food sovereignty and fight to create sustainable businesses, but I'm gonna fight the government too, because they're trying to perpetuate that stuff, you know? And so like sitting in those meetings and stuff, it's just a reminder of how like, um, we don't, as an Indian people, we don't have to fit within their system. We don't have to fit within their system. What we can do as Indian people is we can be raw, authentically who we are, and we can push those systems to change. And, and I think that's, that's at the core of like what so much of Indian collective work is about. And that's why I love like the work that we do. You know, some people think that like you create an organization and then you're like, Oh, you know, I have this organization now. Like I wake up and I'm like, ooh, I want to figure out what's going on at NDN today. Um, because there's so many different things going on. You know, we have uh 
you know, we're at, we're about 35 staff and we're in, uh, you know, we're in, we have offices in on the Nez Perce in Idaho in in Minneapolis in uh, White Earth and, um, you know, Tucson and, um, Oklahoma, and I'm probably leaving out a whole bunch of others, but one of the concepts is, yeah, we have these hubs as NBA Collective. One of them is being in Rapid City, so this organizing hub that we're building here. Our next one is likely gonna be in the Twin Cities area, um, in hubs where there's like a lot of indigenous leadership and activity and things going on, uh, but also that we hire indigenous folks who can actually stay in their communities. That, so that so that an ending collectives work can also be networked into into those communities too, um, because you know we want folks to be able to stay in their communities, um, because we think that some of the best work happens when Indians like are in their communities, in their ceremonies, you know, you know, talking with grandma and grandpa, you know, being out in in, in the community doing those kinds of things. So um, yeah, no, I think that's uh yeah that's kind of. That's kind of like the size of our team and kind of some of the stuff that's happening with the Indian Collective. Awesome. Something, so it, so, something I was wondering about was, you know, there's, there's like, to get your thoughts on this feels like, I'm sure everybody in their time feels this way, but it, it feels like such a watershed moment. I think I like no dapple and standing rock camps. I think about land back launching. I think about, just like all the energy and the movement happening and then like drop, drop COVID on that. You know what I mean? Like that's not even, that's, that's an everyone problem of what's happening right now. Like, what do you see, you know, NDN collective just released a, a kind of one of your grants is kind of like a looking forward, like, you know, resilience building post COVID, like, Hey, what do you imagine's next? Like creatively what's next, not just the response, but, but where are we going? Like, what do you see happening in the next few years? What do you want to see happening in the next few years kind of building from all this? Yeah, I mean, I think it absolutely is. I think that we are in a watershed moment. And I thought, you know, that, that's why I think that we, you know, took this moment. Like when we, when we did the action at July 3rd at Mount Rushmore, it wasn't an anti-Trump rally. It was a land back action in the sacred Chesapa because, because narratives matter, right? framework matters, right? The, and, and there's an opportunity to recenter many of the indigenous people's struggles and issues. And you know, I grew up as a little boy going to treaty council meetings and running around and getting chased out of the kitchen. And, you know, when all these meetings and stuff were going on, you know, and I'm sitting here, you know, uh, thinking, man, this is totally possible. We actually can get the land, land, the land back. We can actually, we can actually get the Black Hills back. Um, there's, there is a real opportunity to see that happen. And it can have economic and political and societal impact on our people. And it'll improve the quality of life for our people. And I think that as indigenous folks, I think what I'd like to see is, you know, as this conversation in this country continues to have a conversation about repair and reparations and healing that we push hard enough um, to, to, to achieve some of the very demands that we're laying out in this campaign. And so, because if these, because of some of these things are achieved, it means that the, the way in which our relationship with our land, our communities, our people, and policies that impact the lives of us every single day, you know, whether you're, you know, at Spisa Corner or Porcupine or wherever, right, um, that you are, that, 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 that there's an opportunity to do that. So I'd like to see, you know, sweeping policy changes. I'd like to see more native people, you know, in, in the offices of political leadership. I would like to see that many of the things that y'all are doing over there at Sichango CDC and Red Code, everything that's going on over there in Sichango territory, um, you know, that, that, that those things are coming to life and fruition. I'd like to see a world where we're not having to spend a bunch of energy fighting pipelines because people have realized that those are terrible things in the first place that we can actually create renewable energy solutions that end up actually, you know, contributing to the economies of our people and building our skills and providing our energy needs. So these are like some of the things that I, 
I really think about. Uh, and I think that I'd like to see that, that, that we as Indian people take advantage of this moment, right? To, um, to, to lift one another up and to see other people's struggles as our struggles and our struggles as other people's struggles. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things, you know, that I'd like to see for sure. Well, Nick, as we get close to wrapping this up, we got about four or five minutes left, but what does it look like for those of us to get involved with this campaign? Is it using the hashtag land back? Is it holding a rally, being involved in a march? What does that look like? Yeah, so a bunch of things. Go to landback.org, type it in, landback.org, use the, you know, obviously use the landback uh, hashtag. Um, we have that you can sign up for e, uh, listserv, you know, uh, e-list at landback.org. Um, you know, we're going to keep putting out more information about how people can engage in this campaign. Um, but read through the website, read through some of the language in there, some of our organizing principles. We have something on there called the Landback Manifesto. Read that manifesto and like, see if you're down with it. You know, um, read some of that mechanism, like some of that stuff. We put all of that out there because we want it to be the Oyates. We want it to be the peoples. So, you know, and then think about how the things that we're saying on that website, how it's directly connected to the things that are happening in your community. Because it's a, it's a meta narrative, right? It's a, it's, a big, it's a big narrative. It's a big movement. But you can connect what you're doing, whether you're a language teacher, you know, on, on Rosebud, or you're, uh, you know, you run a business in Rapid City, or you're on the front lines fighting, you know, fighting, uh, fighting the building of the wall, you know, down on down in Kumeye or uh, Town of Auckland Territory. There's a direct correlation to so many of the things that we're doing um, in the land in the land back narrative. So find those connections. Find those connections. Sign up for the list serve. I think we're eventually going to have something called Land Back Cruise. I, I, actually, that's not public yet, um, but where people can create crews um, that you know, you, you, you know, you, you can you can find ways to engage because it's not just about protesting; it's about building too. It's about doing both of those things um, and connecting those issues. So, yeah, those are different ways people can get involved in the campaign, and of course, folks can follow Indian Collective, um, you know, at Indian Collective on all of the different social medias. Um, and um, every once in a while, the, the, my team made me start a Twitter account, which is totally weird because I'm not on. So I've never been on social media. <laughs> Even my kids are like, "What the hell?" Um, uh, and uh, but I have a Twitter account on there, which we you know are using to put out information too, and that's just at um, what is it at, at Nick Tilson? <laughs> I think that's what it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, like we're, we're trying to be an open book about this stuff, right? And keep putting this information out there. And keep an eye out for Indian Collective. Like we, you know, we're putting out grant opportunities. We have a community self-determination grant opportunity that we're going to be launching in uh, 2021 to give six-figure grant, you know, $100,000 type level of grants to Indigenous-led organizations um, throughout Indian country that are doing the work with Defend, Develop, and Decolonize. Our Change Makers Fellowship. We're about to announce our Radical Imagination grantees. Like. We got some cool stuff going on um, at Indian Collective. And it's really just about uplifting indigenous people and giving, making sure our people are resourced because I think, I don't know, I think when indigenous people are, re are resourced, shit, we change the game. We are dangerous, we are beautiful and we're all of those things. So I'm excited about, I'm excited about where, where the, all of this work is leading. That doesn't get you fired up for your weekend. I don't know what will. Nick Tilson, NDN Collective, thanks for joining, man. It was so awesome just to hear about everything going on. Uh, for all you watching, jump on there. Go check out uh, the Landback website. Follow NDN on, on Facebook, on everything. Just see what they're doing. Um, and, and most importantly, like here in our own community, right, like let's get going. Like the time's now. Let's, let's get moving on some of these awesome things we've, we've been wanting to see. It's, it's all positive so i really appreciate it wanted to take a quick second uh reference back to a past show and, and give a shout out to the census team here on rosebud i got uh at the last update that i had last year or last census we only had 1500 homes counted at the last count that i saw it was over 2800 we're almost there to double it 
awesome work, man. And, and people really pushing hard on that stuff here in, in, in Rosebud. So wanted to give a shout out there and, and also wanted to give a quick update for anyone who hasn't heard. Uh, first 50 Buffalo from Badlands National Park are down at Wolakota. So pretty exciting stuff there. Um, working on getting another uh, 50, I believe, from Teddy Roosevelt National Park coming in, in, in the next uh, next week or so. So everybody stay stay tuned for that. Super exciting, fun project there. Um, but yeah, thanks again. Nick, it's awesome to have you. Stay safe, stay healthy up there. Be well. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having me, both uh, Jillian and uh, and and Mike and and, and uh, you know to to Sichangu Sichangu country um, and to all that you all are doing for your communities and for your people and have a have a good weekend, everybody. Doksha ke wachi ankikte. Doksha. Doksha.